you so much for the kind introduction. And it is really deeply humbling, of course, to follow Jennifer, who, in addition to the many tremendous things that she's done, so clearly feels the weight of moral responsibility for the consequences of the technologies that she's played a role in. And that's why we scientists should be deeply concerned by how well we can predict the consequences of what we do. Because if you take a look around here, just how I'm speaking to all of you, this building, everything, the way we live today has been so profoundly shaped by technology. It's probably fair to say that the future of our civilization will primarily be determined by the technologies that we invent and the wisdom with which we deploy them or refrain. So how, as scientists, should we be going about this? For that matter, please raise your hand if you have done some form of research. Come on. OK, yeah, so we have a lot of us here. So how do you know that your work might be at risk? Well, I don't know how many of you have ever seen the webcomic XKCD, but the author of that webcomic decided to help us out. And here we have a plot of different fields of science. This is everything from astronomy to molasses storage, which is an inner, inner, inner city Boston joke. But it plots everything by the risk that your research will be used by a supervillain for world domination, against the risk that your research will, the subject of your research will escape from the laboratory and threaten the local population. Now, when I saw this, I thought, wow, OK, this explains why I'm so concerned. Because in my laboratory, of course, we work on genetic engineering, microbiology, and to do that, we work with a lot of robotics. And well, yeah, OK. But I'm actually not quite so sure that genetic engineering deserves its pride of place in the upper right corner there. And the reason is something that Charles Darwin said. He said, man selects for his own good, nature for that of the being which she tends. And what he means by that is, of course, when we alter an organism, we're doing so for our benefit, and we're diverting its resources from the ability to reproduce in its natural habitat. Meaning, if we release a selectively bred organism or a CRISPR-edited organism into the wild, it will be outcompeted by its wild counterparts almost every time. But there are, of course, genetic elements in the wild, natural genetic elements, that can spread through populations even if they don't help the organisms reproduce. These are called gene drive systems. The phenomenon is gene drive, and it's completely ubiquitous. By current estimates, more than half of our own DNA comprises broken remnants of gene drive systems of a particular kind. And it's nearly impossible to find a sequence genome that doesn't have gene drive remnants somewhere in it. But with CRISPR now, we can harness gene drive and potentially make organisms in the lab that then, if released, would spread that change through wild populations, thereby affecting entire ecosystems. So I would say that wherever genetic engineering is, gene drive is further up and to the right. So how does it work? Well, if we deliver into the reproductive cells of an organism the DNA change that we want to make in that organism, we also deliver in CRISPR components and guide RNAs. But if you want to build a gene drive, you encode the CRISPR system and the instructions for making the change into the DNA that you're going to insert next to the change you want to spread. So you put this into the cell, it produces the CRISPR components, cuts the target site on the genome, inserts your new sequence. So now, this organism's genome has the instructions for using CRISPR on its own, meaning it's going to continue to produce the CRISPR components, it's going to cut the other chromosome, and copy itself over. Now here's where the magic happens. When this organism mates, now it has two edited copies, so all of its offspring are guaranteed to inherit one. And in those offspring, in their reproductive cells, editing happens again. CRISPR cuts the original version, replaces it with the new one. Meaning when these organisms mate, all of their offspring will inherit. And editing happens again, and again, and again, and again. So again, this is a naturally occurring phenomenon. It's called a homing-based gene drive system. But with CRISPR, we can harness it. 
When we first pointed this out a few years ago, we did so before we actually tested it in the lab, which is pretty controversial. You don't normally do that. We could have been wasting people's time. But as it turns out, it really does work. And now it's been demonstrated in several different organisms. What might we want to do with this? Well, I confess when a, in that original paper we suggested quite a lot of potential uses of this, but I've changed my mind about some of them. I think that this form of gene drive, which is called a self-propagating gene drive because it can spread itself indefinitely, is really only well-suited for a handful of applications. And I want to highlight a few of them here. The first is malaria. Now, in the time I've been speaking, malaria has infected some 10 to 20, 10,000 people, and it's killed five children just in the time that I've been speaking. Out of the 3,500 species of mosquito in the world, three of them are responsible for the majority of malaria cases. So if we use the gene drive system to either alter those mosquitoes so that they couldn't transmit malaria or suppress the population, and this one is probably more reliable, by spreading genes such that if a mosquito inherits two copies, it's infertile, that will suppress the population to a level that is low enough that malaria transmission won't be able to be sustained. So combined with conventional measures like bed nets and malaria treatments, we might be able to eradicate the disease forever. And this project is being led by Austin Burt, who first described the possibility that homing-based gene drive might be harnessed. And they have some incredibly promising mosquito strains. Not evolutionarily stable yet, but the point being, it's not the technical barriers in the way right now. Schistosomiasis. It's the worst of the neglected tropical diseases. You wade into fresh water, it's a little blood fluke, it burrows through your skin, infects you, it can be lifelong if not treated appropriately, and schistosomiasis, in the time I've been speaking, has infected probably some 12,000 people, and it's killed one child. It also causes cognitive growth stunting. So it's, it's a pretty nasty disease, but schistosomes are sexually reproducing, and there's a lot of gene flow between them, meaning that we could suppress the schistosome population with a gene drive directly, and combined with treatments, we might be able to eradicate this disease. And finally, of course, this is Australia, right? You're familiar with organisms that have all sorts of nasty toxins and things like that in, in the environment, right? You're famous for that. But I would have to say that we, in the Americas have the world champion when it comes to a species that, whose very life cycle is a moral atrocity. This is the New World screwworm, Cochleomyia hominivorax, the man devourer. And graphic image warning, what this thing does is it lays its eggs in open wounds, of mammals specifically. And unlike most maggots, which only devour dead tissue, these ones eat the healthy tissue, and they release a pheromone that calls more screwworm flies. So the animal ends up being eaten alive by flesh-eating maggots. This does happen to some people, so we know just how agonizing it is. It is so agonizing that in order to treat a patient, doctors typically have to give them morphine first. So right now, at this very moment, probably billions of mammals are infested with these screwworm flies and are suffering horrendous agony. With gene drive, we could potentially do something about it. What's also noteworthy is that this species is absent from North America because we already eradicated it. But it's more entrenched in South America. Should we continue that process? If we're going to think about it, though, we need to be careful because the first rule of working with biology, as no doubt many of you are familiar, is that we don't understand everything. And that's especially true when it comes to ecosystems. And when you're trying to engineer a complex system you don't completely understand, we should at least be humble enough to admit that we can't completely predict what's going to happen. We might have an idea, but it's never going to be perfect. And so I have two operational rules. Number one, you always want to make the smallest possible change that can solve the problem, because then hopefully that will have the fewest possible side effects. Rule number two is you want to start small and only scale up if warranted. And it's the second rule that is a problem, because how do you start small with a self-propagating gene drive? We recently ran some mathematical models of alteration drive systems and found that they appear to be incredibly invasive. It takes very few organisms to invade a new population. And under most 
conditions, you release them into one population. If there's even a little bit of gene flow, it invades the next and the next and the next. So you probably can't run a field trial of this. If we could control the effects, if we could ensure that it can't propagate itself forever, then we might be able to run a field trial and see what happens at a small scale. We might also be able to potentially solve problems without affecting many nations at the same time. So how do you do that? Well, our current best idea is what's called a daisy drive. And we call it that because we take a CRISPR-based gene drive and we separate the components and scatter them across different chromosomes. And they're linked in a daisy chain. So element C has the instructions telling CRISPR to cut the wild-type locus for element B, thereby copying it. B has the instructions that cause A to be copied. But there's nothing here that causes C to be copied. C is a normal engineered gene, meaning it's never going to increase in the population. In fact, it's probably only, go, only going to go down. So if you have C remain constant, B goes up, and the more B goes up, then A goes up. But of course, in reality, natural selection is dragging all of these down because natural selection has no mercy. So the net effect is kind of like a multi-stage rocket. That is, you increase the frequency of each stage proportional to how far it is down along the chain. And as you progressively lose elements from the chain, then it effectively runs out of fuel and starts going down until it eventually vanishes. In other words, this is a transient, potentially localized gene drive system. And it's also one where we can control the geographic area of effect, according to models, by changing the power of the drive system. You add more elements, takes them longer to run out of them, or just by controlling the number of organisms that we release into the environment. So our hope is that Daisy Drive might provide a way to solve many more problems that you really could never get many different countries to agree upon for a self-propagating drive. You could also solve problems with things like invasive species where you really don't want to use a self-propagating drive because it could spread to the native population. I'm particularly excited, of course, by public health applications, but also animal well-being. We could substantially reduce the suffering that goes on in nature and also even within our cities. We could save endangered species by controlling invasive ones. And even in agriculture, instead of relying on chemical poisons, to kill the pests that would otherwise eat our food, we could instead program the pests to dislike the taste and otherwise go about their normal ecological roles. It's a potential way to use the language of nature as written in DNA to solve ecological problems rather than using poisons and bulldozers. The question, of course, is should we do it? And here I'm going to invoke the Australian philosopher Peter Singer. So Peter, in many ways, founded the animal rights movement. But he's also famous for his parable of the drowning child, which says, suppose you're walking along, you're wearing expensive clothes, and you see a drowning child in a lake. Should you jump in and save the child? And most people say, well, yes, of course. What kind of a horrible person do you think I am? Of course I would jump in to save a child for the cost of my expensive suit. And Peter then says, OK, well, then why aren't you willing to sell your suit and donate that money to save a child in need on the other side of the world? Why do you value that child's life less than this one right in front of you? Which is a great way to show us all what, what terrible people we actually are. So I love this parable for a different reason, which is to say, most of us think we should save the drowning child, right? But we didn't throw the child in the lake, or at least I hope you didn't throw the child in the lake but we still feel obligated to save them, even though we didn't cause the problem. But no one expects us to jump in and save the child unless we know how to swim. And I think that in this case, gene drive and other technologies, developing them is like learning how to swim. It gives us the power to intervene, and as soon as we have that power, we become morally responsible. We take on those moral obligations. We know that humans have a cognitive bias called loss aversion that makes us reluctant to intervene. And we have this idea that if we don't do anything, we can stand still. But I hate to say it, civilization is not sustainable. If we stop inventing stuff, we don't get to stand still. Things will fall apart. 
And similarly, if we don't intervene in many existing problems, they will just get worse. So we need to take that into account when we make these kinds of decisions. Because we are morally responsible for all of the suffering that we could have prevented and chose not to. That said, when it comes to making decisions, the decisions about how to use a technology are profoundly and fundamentally shaped by how we go about developing that technology. And here is where I think gene drive must be done differently. Because traditional science is what one might call closeted. That is, researchers, we don't tell other people what we're, what we're doing. And the reason, of course, is we're afraid that if we share our brilliant idea, then someone with more resources is going to go and get it working first. And they're going to publish, and they're going to get all the credit, and we're going to get none. And from my perspective, maybe I can take that, but if it was my student's brilliant idea, and then they get nothing, that could potentially doom their career. How can I possibly risk my student's career for that? On the other hand, for gene drive, there's a number of very compelling reasons why we should pre-register all gene drive experiments. Reason number one, if I'm inventing a medical technology, if I'm developing that, it shouldn't really bother you if I'm doing that behind closed doors. Because once it's developed and approved, and your doctor recommends it to you, you can always say no. Some of you can say yes, some of you can say no, and that works perfectly fine. You can opt out. If I'm developing a gene drive system, then that's intended to alter the shared environment. Once it's done, if you live there, you cannot opt out. You will be affected. So the decisions that I am making early on in development are going to eventually affect you. If I develop that in secret, I am denying you a voice in decisions that will affect you. And that's why my group pre-registers everything that we're doing that involves ecological engineering, even if it doesn't involve gene drive. We're working with the communities of Nantucket and Martha's Vineyard off the coast of Massachusetts on engineering mice that normally infect ticks with diseases such as Lyme disease, such that the mice can no longer be infected, thereby breaking the cycle of transmission. And in a couple of days, I'll be going over to Aotearoa. We've been invited by Teharenga, the Maori Biosecurity Network, to discuss the possibility of using these kinds of technologies to remove invasive mammalian predators. Of course, there's another reason why we should pre-register our gene drive experiments, which is, if we don't, why should you trust us? Seriously, why should you trust a scientist who insists on doing work on this kind of technology in secret. Especially when, if we have an accident, I believe there was something earlier about that risk of the thing you're studying escaping the laboratory and threatening the local population. Personally, I am deeply, deeply skeptical that there would be any ecological consequences if a gene drive were to be accidentally released from the laboratory. Most of them do things like change the color of the organism, at most. Change a marker that's invisible, would have no effect whatsoever. But that's ecological effect. The social reaction, I imagine, would be pretty negative. So negative that I'm pretty sure that Austin's valiant effort to develop gene drive against malaria would probably be delayed substantially, at least judging by what happened when there was a tragedy in the field of gene therapy. And if you delay, if they say there's a 1% chance that our doing gene drive research in secret will delay Austin's effort by 10 years, the expected cost in children's lives is 25,000, if there's just a 1% chance. Why take that risk? But it's the last one that I find most compelling. Because why, why is it that we scientists don't share what we're doing from the get-go? Do we honestly think that science progresses more rapidly? I'm skeptical. And to really convey this, I have to tell you a story. And it does involve CRISPR-based gene drive. So it, it ties in pretty closely to, to the theme here. When we developed it, again, we told the world about it before we actually tried it. And then we tried it in yeast and verified that it worked. But I was corresponding with Austin, and we were trying to figure out how to raise awareness of the issue. Because what we were worried about was that everybody was then using CRISPR in tremendous variety of organisms. 
what if some laboratory independently invented CRISPR-based gene drive, not realizing what a gene drive was? What if all they wanted to do was knock out both copies of a gene in their organism in a single step, and then possibly propagate that change down through their laboratory strains? That'd be a very useful genetic tool. What if somebody did that, not realizing that it could spread in the wild? So we did our best to raise awareness. Too late, somebody did it. These are brilliant, well-meaning scientists who did it. But they were developmental biologists. They didn't know what a gene drive was. There's no reason to expect them to know what a gene drive was. It's unreasonable. You have to specialize in science in order to stay at the forefront. No one else has, no one has time to do everything. So the lesson of this story is that even brilliant and well-meaning scientists cannot reliably anticipate the consequences of their work. The world is just too big. Because so much work is closeted, even if someone does see something wrong, we can't possibly warn them because we don't know who they are or that they're doing it at all. Finally, six years ago, no one imagined that we would have a tool that would work in so many different species in terms of editing their genomes. And certainly, no one imagined that we might be able to edit entire wild populations. I'm a huge science fiction buff, and I know a lot of other huge science fiction buffs at the MIT Media Lab, and none of us has been able to find an example anywhere in science fiction that even suggests this idea. It seems to have been completely unprecedented, and yet now we think we can do it, which just goes to show you that our technological capabilities can increase very suddenly and in very unexpected directions. Put all this together, and it's a little bit concerning. So my hypothesis is that open science will be not just faster and more efficient, because we can intelligently decide to collaborate or compete based on what we know other people are working on, are interested in, and can now do. I think it will also be safer. Because if you do want to anticipate consequences, the best way to do it is to invite others to share their wisdom. So the reason why we share everything that we do all of our grant proposals are online, experiments pre-registered, is because I want as many people as possible to take a look at it and try to identify something that might go wrong that we haven't thought of. For Mice Against Ticks, someone on Nantucket who just happened to come to a town hall meeting already thought of something that none of us had thought of that might well change how the de deployment might eventually happen on that island if they decide to go forwards with it. So this really can work. People will come up with things that we have never considered and it can make things not just safer, but also more effective. But we depend on science. We need new inventions. And remember rule two of ecological engineering, start small and only scale up if warranted. So we don't want to change how all of science is done. That would be profoundly reckless and irresponsible. What we need is a small scale field trial of a more open way of doing science. So, I propose that gene drive be that field trial. If we want it to happen, we have to change the incentives for scientists working with gene drive. That means that universities who make hiring decisions, funders who fund our work, journals who publish it and thereby determine recognition, all need to get together and change the incentives for gene drive research. But that's a collective action problem. None of them wants to do it unless all of the others do, which is why Intellectual property, which is normally not something we think of as a very progressive tool, could actually be very useful because there's key intellectual property that is required to build this kind of gene drive system. If the holders of intellectual property came together and said any gene drive product needs to have been developed in the open if it's going to be licensed, then that could get the ball rolling and then the others might move along. So I think that that could end up being more important than any actual application of gene drive. Because the world is an incredibly bright and promising place, but we need to get there. I think we can do it. But we need to get there together. So when it comes to science, I think we need to open the doors, part the clouds, and let the sunlight in. Because only together can we, can we be wise. 
Thank you.